615, Series 6, Episode 15. Greetings, listeners. It is I, Lobelia Wayne Scott Spitzer, here to talk to you once again about the Cthulhu Mythos, its books, its monsters, its unfortunate human casualties, its timeline in general, and even its tangential bits, like the dreamlands or things of a weird nature or things that are Lovecraftian leaning. Once more we head into those dark woods. Once again we walk down the lightless stone staircase in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at PGTTCM. Check out our websites at PGTTCM.com, PGTTCM.podbean.com. Help support the show by clicking the donate button or going to Patreon.com slash PGTTCM. Thank you. Thank you. Remember to keep warm this winter with slippers from bunnyslippers.com. They've got some really cool Cthulhu slippers. And keep your torso looking cool with uh, some founddomclothing.com t-shirts. Founddomclothing.com. They've got t-shirts. Looking cool but feeling warm. Looking awesome and listening to a rad podcast. <laughs> People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos starts now. Welcome to People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos. This is Daniel Spitzer and Seraphie. How are you doing? I'm doing all right. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. Uh, it's uh, last weekend or last week of uh, January. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... We're almost getting into the February slide to spring. Yep, yep. Almost... Someday. Yeah, almost getting to the uh, hiatus that we take right before we uh, get ready for season seven. Season I know. I've got oh. the schedule all planned and yeah. got some cool things coming up for the Patreon that mm-hmm. we're going to be uh, mm-hmm. talking about next season. Some new levels. Yeah. Some yeah, yeah. new gifts. Ooh. Some new rewards. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so it's going to actually, you know, be worthwhile to be a Patreon for PGTTCM.com. Woohoo. Yeah. And we're going to be talking about Dunwich, Massachusetts this week. Mm-hmm. And also we're going to be talking about Dunwich Dungeon, uh, part three of our review of Byron Craft's Arkham Detective Collection. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. It's a good one. Yeah. So, uh... He's a fun author. Yeah. Yeah. Cool guy, too. Yeah. So, uh, ha- ha- you, you, you finally got over being sick? Uh, almost. Almost done. Almost, almost done. Almost done. Okay. Still got that slight tickle. Yeah, yeah, I still got a bit of a cough. A little bit of a runny nose <coughs> now and then. Yeah. But yeah. Well, at least you're up out of the sick bed. Yeah, no, that's that's always a good thing. That's yeah. always a good thing. All right. And speaking of something that's sick. <laughs> <laughs> the Dunwich Horror. The Dunwich Horror. <laughs> Dunwich is a fictional town that appears in the H.P. Lovecraft's short story, The Dunwich Horror, in 1929. Dunwich is found in the fictional Miskatonic River Valley of Massachusetts, part of the imaginary region sometimes called Lovecraft Country. The inhabitants are depicted as inbred, uneducated, and very superstitious, while the town itself is described as economically poor with many decrepit and abandoned buildings. Lovecraft may have named the town after the lost port of Dunwich in Suffolk, England, This town was the subject, though not mentioned by name, of Algernon Charles Swinburne's poem, The North Sea, which was an anthology owned by Lovecraft. This Dunwich also appears in Arthur Mackin's novella, The Terror, 1917, which Lovecraft is known to have read. Lovecraft also could have been inspired by other New England towns with names ending in which, such as Ipswich near Salem, Massachusetts, East and West Greenwich in Rhode Island, and Greenwich, Massachusetts, a rural town that has since been flooded to create the Quimbin Reservoir. Although the English town is pronounced Dunitch, similar to the Rhode Island Greenwich, Lovecraft never specified how he preferred his Dunitch to be pronounced. Dunitch or Dunwich? Who knows? Lovecraft is said to have based Dunwich on Athol, Massachusetts, and other towns in western Massachusetts. In what may be a case of coincidence, there is a town named Waitley. Wilbur Waitley was the main antagonist in the Dunwich Horror. The town of Waitley is located in rural Massachusetts near the Connecticut River. 
Lovecraft locates Dunwich in north central Massachusetts. Found by travelers taking the wrong fork at the junction of Aylesbury Pike just beyond Dean's Corner. Aylesbury and Dean's Corners are both Lovecraft creations, neither of which appears in any of his stories. Although Aylesbury is mentioned in his poem sequence, Fungi from Yagoth. And the Aylesbury Turnpike is mentioned in The Lurker at the Threshold. The Dunwich Horror describes uh, the region around Dunwich as a lonely and curious country, broken up with ravines of problematical depth and stretches of marshland that one instinctively dislikes. There is dense natural growth and abundant wildlife such as whippoorwills, fireflies, and bullfrogs, though the planted fields appear singularly few and barren. The sparsely scattered houses wear a surprisingly uniform aspect of age, squalor, and dilapidation, while the gnarled, solitary inhabitants are silent and furtive. Lovecraft describes the village of Dunwich itself. Across a covered bridge, one sees a small village huddled between the stream and the vertical slope of Round Mountain and wonders at the cluster of rotting gambrel roofs bespeaking an earlier architectural period than that of the neighboring region. It is not reassuring to see, on a closer glance, that most of the houses are deserted and falling to ruin, and that the broken steepled church now harbors the one slovenly mercantile establishment of the hamlet. One dreads to trust the tenderest tunnel of the bridge, yet there is no way to avoid it, once across, it is hard to prevent the impression of a faint, malign odor about the village street, as of the massed mold and decay of centuries. It is always a relief to get clear of the place and to follow the narrow road around the base of the hills and across the level country beyond till it rejoins the Aylesbury Pike. Afterward, one sometimes learns that one has been through Dunwich. After the Dunwich horror, Lovecraft did not mention Dunwich in his prose fiction again, though the town does appear in his poem, The Ancient Track, 1929. The town was used as a setting by Agidog Derlet in his posthumous collaborations with Lovecraft, notably in The Shuttered Room, 1959. At dusk, the wild, lonely country guarding the approaches to the village of Dunwich in north-central Massachusetts seems more desolate and forbidding than it ever does by day. Twilight lends the barren fields, domed hills, a strangeness that sets them apart from the country around that area. It brings to everything a kind of silent, watchful animosity. A quote from The Shuttered Room by Agidag Derleth. And here is a summary of that same story. By Tor Books. We, we poached this from Tor Books. Yeah. Tor.com. Abner Waitley, educated in the best schools of Europe, returned to the, to the Dunwich homestead of his grandfather, Luther Waitley. When visiting as a child, he sometimes felt the area's forbidding atmosphere so keenly that he begged his mother to take him away. Now he comes back only to settle Luther's estate. In the crumbling house, he finds a missive from his grandfather. Abner, he writes, is the only Waitley who's gone forth into the world and will succumb neither to the superstition of ignorance nor the superstition of science. He must destroy the ancient mill on the Miskatonic attached to the house. If he finds anything alive inside, he must kill that creature, however small, however humi humaniform. Weird, Abner thinks, but then so was Luther. The old man locked his daughter Sarah in a room over the mill and tended to her himself, carrying up trays of mostly raw meat. No one else saw her from the time she came home, mazed from a visit, visit to Innsmouth Kin, until the time of her death. Forbidden as a boy to approach his aunt's room, Abner goes to explore it now. He finds a barren cell of scattered bedclothes and darkened windows. Their exterior shutters have been nailed shut. The fishy smell of the place sickens him, and he kicks out the shutters of one window to get some air. One window pane also breaks, but hey, he's got to tear down the whole mill, so why worry? He shoves a bureau aside, looks down to glimpse a frog or toad, scrambling back under it. Abner doesn't bother routing the harmless beast. That night, he's disturbed by the deafening chorus of crickets and katydids, frogs and whippoorwills. Next day, he has an odd encounter with a formerly unknown Waitley cousin, Tobias, who runs the one store in Dunwich. Tobias hopes Abner's not back to start things again, 
Back at the house, Abner finds Zebulon Waitley, Luther's brother. The old man speaks of the Waitley curse and warns Abner to beware whatever devil's work went on under Luther's roof. Zebulon doesn't know what happened when Sarah visited their Marsh cousins in Innsmouth, but knows Luther kept a record. Abner resolves to get his Dunwich business done as fast as possible. He inspects the mill for salvage and notices Betrachian footprints on the mill wheel leading to and from the broken window of Sarah's room. A closer look perturbs him. The prints look like tiny human hands and feet, except for webbing between, quote, toes and, quote, fingers. Among Luther's papers are letters describing the Marsh's queer doings, their mixing with South Sea Islanders, their degenerate appearance, their worship of outlandish gods like Dagon and Cthulhu. Legend says the Islanders are really deep ones, amphibious, amphibians who have an underwater city beyond Devil Reef and who've spawned hybrid offspring with Innsmouthers. Apparently, the Deep Ones and their hybrids can grow huge, provided they're well-fed. Starved, they shrink. Now, not that rational Luther will believe such nonsense, but he should know that Sarah's been seen with the particularly repulsive Ralsamarsh and swum out to Devil's Reef with him and a bunch of other Innsmouthers, all of them naked. With the letters is a 1928 news clipping about a fed raid on Innsmouth said to have carried off the marshes and the torpedoing of Devil Reef. Abner reads on. After Luther writes that he's punished Sarah, entries describe increasing frog and whippoorwill populations around the mill. One cryptic entry is R out again. R? Ralsa? Next, Luther catalogs killings of local animals from turtles to cows. People disappear next, then are back at last, and Luther notes nailing shutters over Sarah's windows. Meanwhile, the window Abner unshuttered has fallen entirely out as if pushed from inside. Sarah's old room has a fresh stench, like an animal's lair. Also, the Dunwich par party lines humming with gossip about mutilated cows and frightened speculations about whether it's come back. Abner struggles with the puzzle Luther left him. Then comes another panic on the party line. Luke Lang screams for help because it is trying to break into his house. An unearthly thing that shuffles and hops. Sound of a window breaking. Luke's last screech. One of the listener cries out, It's Abner Waitley's done it! Abner throws his things into the car, then pauses for more puzzling. Even after a rock-born message crashes through his window. Get out before you get killed. He hears noises from the shuttered room and grabs an oil lamp to investigate. What he finds squatting and slavering on the tumbled bedding is a monstrous beast, neither all frog nor all man. It rises towering and launches itself at Abner. Abner throws the oil lamp, setting the beast on fire. It wails, ma, 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 ma. Abner runs for his car. As he gets the hell out of Dunwich at last, Luther's mill and house go up in flames, tearing through the brooding hills and clamoring whippoorwills. Abner thinks, oh, of course, Sarah Waitley and Ralsa Marsh had an unblessed union and produced little deep one Ralsa, whom Luther locked in the shuttered room with his mother. A monster, but still, too bad he was never released into the sea to join the other minions of Dagon and Cthulhu. Many Cthulhu mythos stories by other writers have also been set in Dunwich, some of which are collected in the Dunwich cycle. The town is also the setting of the loose film adaptation of Lovecraft's story, also called The Dunwich Horror, 1970, starring Dean Stockwell and Sandra Dee. The horror film, City of the Living Dead, 1980, directed by Lucio Felucci, features a town called Dunwich named as a tribute to Lovecraft. The Sun Dog, a novella by Stephen King that appears in the 1990 collection Four Past Midnight, gives passing mention to a fellow in Dunwich, Massachusetts, to whom Pop, Merrill, had once sold a so-called spirit trumpet for $90. The fellow had taken the trumpet to the Dunwich Cemetery and must have heard something exceedingly unpleasant because he had been raving in a padded cell in Arkham for almost six years now, totally insane. The Ancient Track by H.P. Lovecraft. At a 
out here like I? There was no hand to hold me back. That night I found the ancient track. Over the hill and strained to see the fields that teased my memory. This tree that wall, I knew them well, and all the roofs and orchards fell familiarly upon my mind as from a past not far behind. I knew what shadows could be cast when the late moon came up at last from back of Zaman's hill and how the veil would shine three hours from now and when the path grew steep and high and seemed to end against the sky I had no fear of what might rest beyond that silhouetted crest straight on I walked a while all night grew pale the phosphorescent light a wall and farmhouse gable glowed unearthly by the climbing road and there the milestone that I knew two miles to Dunwich now the view of distant spire and roof would dawn with ten more upward paces gone there was no hand to hold me back. That night I found the ancient track and reached the crest to see outspread a valley of, lo of the lost and dead. And over Zaman's hill the horn of a malignant moon was born to light the weeds and vines that grew on ruined walls I never knew. The foxfire glowed in fields and bog and unknown waters spewed a frog whose curling talons mocked the thoughts that I had never knew known this spot too well i saw from the mad scene that my loved past had never been nor was i now upon the trail descending to that long dead vale around was fog ahead the spray of star streams in the milky way there was no hand to hold me back that night i found the ancient track People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos is brought to you by BunnySlippers.com and FoundAdamClothing.com. Remember, you can follow the show at PGTTCM.com and PGTTCM.Podbean.com. We're also on Facebook. We're on YouTube. We're on Twitter. We're on... Fire? I don't know. Anyway, you can find us online at a multitude of places. You can support the show by following our Amazon link, which is currently Bobby D's Sex and the Cthulhu Mythos, and shop Amazon as you would, we get a small percentage for sending you towards Amazon. You can also check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash pgttcm. Next season, we're going to have prizes, rewards, whatnot. I guess I can't say prizes. Rewards and whatnot for listeners and donations and all that kind of fun stuff. And, of course, you can just go to paypal.me slash pgttcm, donate what you want, when you want, Heck, you can go to... No, I don't think the Amazon wish list is up anymore. Anyway, thank you for supporting PGTTCM. Thank you for listening, and thank you for being cool. All right, back to the show. The Dunwich Dungeon by Byron Craft. Ian Woodhead was a dreamer. Dreamers especially, those of prodigious talents, do not require the darkness to sleep or dream. Rarely were great dreamers insomniacs. And Ian was just such a person since he could fall asleep at the drop of a hat. Ian Woodhead could make his mind as blank as a fresh leaf of paper. No places of wonder were glimpsed from the mind's eye to distract his resting. No marvelous secrets unfurled. His sleep was a temporary death. It didn't frighten him, though, because Ian was certain there was no death from the perspective of infinity. Once in deepest slumber, he could escape the darkness between his ears within that collection of wet matter and electricity. He was so adept at crisscrossing dreamland that he could blithely circumnavigate around the world leader who sat and waited, sharpening its black claws, tearing at inexperienced travelers. Escaping his earthly bonds was normally an enjoyable and exciting experience for Ian that had sometimes for Ian that he sometimes used for pure adventure, at others became helpful during an investigation. And at others became helpful during an investigation. Most of his dreams that way. Most of his dreams were that way, but now he truly needed to escape a physical prison. For his body lay captive in a stone dungeon of indestructible confinement. He had been lured into a trap, and his keeper had left him to rot. That door, that impregnable barrier of iron and steel, could only be undone from the outside. 
he was lost for all natural means of release. No amount of shouting or pounding could bring about help because he had been incarcerated far from civilization in the countryside of Dunwich. His only hope was to travel deeper into the dreamland that he never journeyed before, through unknown realms, and find his old friend, the policeman. This is the Dunwich, or Dunwich Dungeon, by Byron Craft. That was the first bit of uh, quite of an enjoyable book. Uh, once again, we uh, enjoyed the journeys and uh, the uh, <clears throat> story of a particular, uh, particular uh, police station in Arkham, Massachusetts, Precinct 13. And yeah, no, uh, again, it's uh, Byron Craft's uh, uh, hard-boiled detective stories. A little bit of Henry Kudder mixed with a little bit of a uh, uh, little bit of H.P. Lovecraft, a little bit of hard-boiled dick action. Don't snicker it when I say dick. You, <laughs> you said you were going to be quiet. You're supposed to be quiet. Anyway, pick it up. It's, it's really good. Pick it up. It's really good. Byroncraftbooks.com. The Arkham Detective is the collection, and the story is the Dunwich Dungeon. I highly recommend it. All right. Yes. <laughs> All right. So, uh, that was Dunwich Dungeon. And, uh, which, surprisingly, far less disturbing than the shuttered room. Mm. <laughs> oh, yeah, the shuttered room. The shuttered room. I, I, I have a feeling you have some thoughts and feelings about <laughs> the shuttered room. Well, okay, so we did a reading of the Dunwich Horror a couple of episodes back. Yes. And um, I found this story both disturbing and evocative, uh -huh. which is the best you want in a horror, horror story, I feel. Yeah. You want... You want to feel like it's a gross thing to think about in some ways. And um, and then the same feelings came up for me again when I was reading the synopsis for The Shuttered Room. But I don't think that the horror and gross feelings that I had about the story were what the authors were going for. <laughs> yeah. Because I believe that their focus for the horror was the idea that there was this monster that wanted to eat people. Whereas the horror I found was the idea that it was okay to lock up a girl who is pregnant with some sort of gross spawn, either by her father's machinations or some other family member's machinations. And can we just say incest gross? Yeah. And then, um, you know, and then, like, in the case of the shuttered room, forced to spend the rest of her life locked in with that spawn. It's just like, ugh. Ugh. I mean, pregnancy is kind of horrific enough when you go into it willingly and with the knowledge that it's going to turn into a human being who will grow up and, you know, be another person in the world. Um, and thinking about the idea that one's body could be used that way with no consent and probably with, like, a lot of, like, protest and gross feelings. Ugh. Just, just totally horrific to me. Totally horrific to me. Yeah. 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 So we can we can just. Pretty I mean, much... the people eating aside. <laughs> so we can just sum up uh, stories involving Dunwich tend to tend to be gross. Well, yeah, I think that they do, but I also think that the reason the shuttered room is like that is because it's just really a retelling of the Dunwich horror. Well, yeah, no, no, I mean, Durless was yeah. kind of well known for just kind of swapping out elements of the mythos and mm -hmm. calling it a new story and adding fragments from uh, Lovecraft's commonplace book and yeah hey we got a new story well listen Spitzer he had to make money somehow yeah I know I know I know I had to had to make sure that people knew who H.P. Lovecraft was so that we could be talking about him today well I mean yeah I mean okay so like without him would Byron Craft be writing the Dunwich Dungeon? No, probably the not. The Arkham Detective? Probably not. The Cry of Cthulhu? Probably not. No, I don't think so, because he probably wouldn't have even known that these ideas existed. Yeah. I mean, although I don't know, I mean, maybe as a young man he read a lot of weird fiction stories. Possibly, possibly, and 
I have to say, as uh, and you also as a science fiction horror mm -hmm. uh, reader, um, there was writers who we grew up with, and even mm -hmm. like our parents grew up with, who's like were definitely influenced by H.P. Lovecraft. Oh yes, and, for sure. You know, um, like like Robert Bloch, who prolific, prolific writer, wrote mm -hmm. everything from Psycho to Green Lantern mm -hmm. comics to. Uh, all kinds of short stories, television shows like Night Gallery, oh, yeah. all kinds of stuff like that. And he was a, you know, uh, a disciple of Lovecraft. Mm -hmm. And Well, and like Terry Pratchett, my favorite author of all time, uh -huh, uh -huh. is totally influenced by Lovecraft. Lots of references in his Discworld novels. Sure. And of course, I didn't get those references until recently. Mm -hmm. But now, thinking about it, I'm like, oh yeah, of course, this makes sense. That makes sense. And all that Neil Gaiman stuff that you like. Oh, and, yeah. You know, there's 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 some uh, Lovecraft influence. Yeah. But I'm just so glad that the authors that we like use, like, certain Lovecraft right. elements and not, not other others. Lovecraft yeah. elements. Well, I mean, <laughs> so, I mean, like, okay, so we can all agree, lovers of Lovecraft that we are, that his, his ability to describe a creepy scene is amazing. Correct. Um... Like, the poem that's in this episode mm -hmm. is really evocative. Yes. There's some beautiful imagery yes. in that. It just, no. you know, you really feel like you're in this sort of Miss Swath different place. Yes, yes. Where the creepiness and the, like, you know, unknown horrors are right below the surface. Lovecraft can paint a scene. Exactly. Lovecraft cannot develop a character. No, he cannot. And, and um, so, like, poetry, of course, would be the perfect milieu for him the perfect Certainly. the perfect vehicle yeah yeah but uh stories with humans interacting with each other <laughs> well that's one of the things i really liked about the terrible old man one of the things i loved about that one is that the whole story while somewhat character driven is all tongue in cheek and sort of like fourth person and like there's no like actual character development there's like oh what were they trying to get away with that's not gonna work we all know how the story's going to end yeah. and it the whole thing with the suspended rocks and the, it's like it's evocative and descriptive and there's zero women in it which i love um <laughs> so that's great and you know that story was great yeah and um, I guess there was the whole thing with, like, the the idea that people outside are going to be stupid because they don't know. Yeah. What was it called? The heterogeneous di diaspora, yeah. I think was the <laughs> terminology, which, like, <laughs> is, like, talk about horror, the, the horror that Lovecraft felt for mixing, yeah. if you will. Certainly. Oh, my God. Yeah. What, what... Okay. What a discerning purist he was. This particular story, which I have not read either, just the synopsis, yeah. feels like he pretty much got the Dunwich Horror under his pen and then was like, let's change this to that, let's change, you know, like, let's let's not make it be a warlock summoning yag Sathas. let's make it just be a guy whose daughter goes to Innsmouth. Sure. You know, and then, and then she comes back quote, mazed, unquote, which I guess is, uh, a, like, a metaphor for the kind of trauma one can expect after some sort of rape and or not rape session with one's kin or not kin. It, uh, the whole thing is so... Anyway. So she comes back, and then she's, you know, imprisoned for the rest of her life with her spawn, and... Her inhuman spawn. Her inhuman spawn, right. So is the horror... The, I think that Augie's idea, Durla's idea of the horror in this film, in this story was that the uh, the mixing, the inhuman spawn, the human-eating inhuman spawn... Frankly, once you start eating cows, eating humans is kind of a come down from that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, unless you're going for brain matter. If what you want to eat is brain matter, then yeah, cows to humans. But otherwise, it would be humans and then cows, if yeah. you're going size-wise. Yeah. So, that's weird, right? Yeah. Or maybe it's its daringness. Oh, maybe, but I think but cows are... it's no are, longer afraid of man. But cows are so much... Yeah. ...harder to get to than humans. 
Yeah. I imagine it probably. I, I, you know what? I'm not, I'm not going to try to imagine this. <laughs> I'm not going to try and imagine. No. No. <clears throat> well, I mean, like, in real life, uh-huh. once a predator... I mean, so, like, there's this whole thing about, like, you got to hunt down a li- a man-eating lion because once they get a taste of human flesh, then yeah, they're not yeah. going to stop. And that's true. It's because they lose their fear of humans realizing that we're super easy to kill. Yeah. You know. So I think that's probably what they're going with with this. Yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, this thing is, like, part human? Yeah. I just, I just told totally also hate the implication that it died saying, Mama, Mama. Ugh. Yeah. Obviously, his mother has been dead for a long time. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know either. The whole thing's just gross. I feel a little dirty, actually, talking about it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, on that note, (laughs) stay squeakly (laughs) to keep it weird. That was series six. Peace in the Middle East. For the Central Core, and we'll be back in uh, less than a month with some new stuff. Yes, guests, Series 7. Series 7, it's going to be awesome. Woohoo! All right. People's Guide to the Cthulhu Mythos is part of the Dark Myths Collective. Edited and written by D.B. Spitzer. Audio performances by Sarah Fee and Daniel Spitzer. Thank you so much for listening. PGTTCM.com and the RSS feed comes out of PGTTCM.podbean.com. And thank you again. And we'll see you next season. Remember, you can check out Byron Craft's books at ByronCraftBooks.com. That is, again, ByronCraftBooks.com. Okay. Thanks again. PGTTCM. See you in a couple of weeks. And uh, just check us out on iTunes, because although we won't be recording new episodes, I will be putting uh, new readings up. So look forward to that. All right. And pgtcm.podbean.com. Can I get a pgtcm.podbean.com again? pgtcm.podbean.com again.